I would like to talk about our um, experiments which we do at ETH Zurich in which we combine a quantum gas, so a Bose-Einstein condensate, with a high finesse optical cavity. And this combination of these two ingredients gives rise to long-range interactions between these particles. And you see on this first slide, you see our artistic view of what goes on. So you see um, atoms, so these red marbles, which uh, sit in a potential, and this potential is um, self-consistently formed due to the interaction between the atoms and the light. And the self-consistent potential can also be seen as a long-range interaction between the particles, and that's something you see here, this stream of photons stored inside the cavity mediates an interaction over a large distance between two of those particles. Our work is rooted in the field of quantum simulation, so that's something you might know. Imagine you have a Hamiltonian at hand, and this Hamiltonian might either describe describe a real piece of matter or it can describe some artificial synthetic material you are interested in to know the properties of. So if you want to know the properties you need to solve this Hamiltonian and um, solving, what, what does it mean? Solving means that you want to know the ground states of the system depending on parameters A and B in this example and you want to know uh, the phase diagram of the system and you want to know the excitations of the system. So this is all what it means to solve this Hamiltonian and there are different ways how you can solve it and one way is to do a quantum simulation. So there you take a, a quantum many-body system which you have under ideally perfect control and implement the different terms of this Hamiltonian in uh, your experimental quantum many-body system. And then, because you have the perfect control, you can tune parameter A and B and you do a measurement and you find uh, the phase diagram and the excitations of the system, which means you have solved this Hamiltonian. Now, cold atoms or ultra-cold atoms are, have been proved to be a very powerful platform for this kind of experiments. And this is because we have excellent control over both the internal and the external degrees of freedom of these atoms and we can shape the potentials in into which we load the atoms uh, basically at will. So we can use uh, light fields and magnetic fields to shape these potentials. And then, very important, we can also um, change the interactions between these particles. So you can imagine if two particles collide, then there is a, the S-wave collision between these particles, and this is something one can tune with a so-called Faschbach reson resonance, where one tunes a magnetic field, and by this one can tune these short-ranged interactions. This field has evolved uh, a lot in the last years, and um, here are some of the directions, research directions, um, which are pursued in these quantum simulations with ultra-cold atoms. So you see it's mostly about strongly correlated matter, but we can simulate artificial gauge fields. There is something like the idea of quantum annealing, driven dissipative systems, spin models, long-range interactions, topology, all these topics enter into this field of quantum simulation, and that's not all, but it's a selection. And what you also should understand is that there's an interconnection between all those fields, um, which makes it very interesting, because you can map the concepts which we find in our simulations to a number of different uh, physical situations, and then learn also about them. I'd like to highlight um, two of those topics, and I'm highlighting them because that's what I would like to talk to you about. One is long-range interactions, and the other one is about driven dissipative systems. So why, wh why is this interesting? Well, I told you that cold atoms are very good if you want to investigate situations where you can tune the short-range interactions, so the collisional properties. But long-range interactions is something which is hard to access with cold atoms. At the same time, there's a quest to simulate or to access long-range interactions. And this is because if you go into nature and, and look where long-range interactions are important, then um, there are many situations in which they are dominant. So this goes from astronomical length scales down to the microscopics and to the nanoscopics, 
So every time when there is something like a structure formation, so it can be a material that forms or a protein that folds, then you need a long-range interaction in the system. Without long-range interaction, you will not get any structure. So now you understand why there is a quest to have long-range interactions also in the quantum simulation with atoms. The other topic I would like to talk about are driven dissipative systems. And now if you imagine you have a, a quantum many-body system, then um, as I told you, it's an interesting system. But um, if you think of any experimental realization, then there will always be a bit of dissipation. And now you can deal with this dissipation in two different ways. You can either say, well, I have my system so well shielded that I do my experiments on a short enough time scale such that I don't care about this dissipation. Or you say, well, this dissipation is actually of importance even, or especially if you think also of, of devices in, in, in the quantum realm where you want to uh, facilitate quantum many-body systems um, to do something useful, then you will always end up in a situation where you have actually a drive and dissipation. So this dissipation can mean you have loss of particles, it can mean you have loss of energy out of the system, and that's something you can replenish if you have a drive. But now you can ask what, what happens to this quantum many-body system in the presence of drive and dissipation. And questions which are arising here are, for example, well, you can't talk about ground states anymore. Now you need to talk about steady states. You can still expect that there are phases and phase transitions, but you can ask whether uh, the criticality of the system has changed. So if you think in terms of phase transitions and their universality classes, then this might be changed to, to the presence of drive and dissipation. And then if you think more of applications, you can ask whether you can engineer new properties of the system. Okay, so this brings me to the outline of my talk. Um, at the beginning, I would like to introduce to you how we create these cavity-mediated long-range interactions, which are then important for both parts which I would like to present to you. And I, my talk will have two parts. One is about self-organization of atoms in repulsive potentials. So that's the formation of structure in a, a repulsive potential. And then in the second part, I will show you about a dissipation stabilized phase in a superradiant quantum gas. So in the second part, it's really about how dissipation is influencing the system. But let me start with the cavity-mediated long-range interactions. I am motivated that there's a quest for this, uh, for the realization of these long-range interactions. And if you think of atoms or cold atoms, and you ask how can they interact over long distance, then the natural way to go is to use dipole-dipole interactions. So this is how atoms can interact besides colliding with each other. But now how do we get dipoles into the atoms? So one way is to use not single atoms, but heteronuclear molecules. Then those molecules will have a permanent electric dipole moment, and this dipole moment then gives rise to this interaction. Another approach would be to use species of atoms which have a strong magnetic dipole moment, like erbium, chromium, dysprosium, and then this magnetic interaction gives rise to uh, the long-range interactions you are looking for. Yet another other approach would be to admix a uh, Rydberg state to your atomic states, and then this is an induced electric dipole moment which lets the atoms interact. What we are doing is to follow a complementary approach and to make use of cavity-mediated long-range interactions. And the, the basic principle is shown on this slide here. You see that we load a Bose-Einstein condensates or a cloud of ultra cold atoms of rubidium-87 into a cavity which is formed by these two mirrors. Then we illuminate the atoms from the side with a standing wave laser field, which is far retitude with respect to the atomic resonance. So it's not electronically exciting the atoms, but the atoms just act as scatterers for the photons. So we drive the dipole, the electric dipole, which we induce with the laser field in the atoms. That's something which we drive, and then this dipole can emit. And if we put a resonance of this cavity close by to the frequency of the driving laser, then this emitted photons will preferentially end up in the mode of the cavity. 
Now, the fundamental process giving rise to long-range interactions is the following. We take a photon from the drive field and scatter it at the first atom into the cavity mode. Then it's scattered back to the pump at a second at at atom. Now, those two atoms have interacted with each other by the exchange of a cavity photon. And since this photon is delocalized over the entire cavity mode, this interaction is of global range. You can write down an interaction potential, and you see that this potential inherits the standing wave character of the pump and of the cavity field. So what it gives rise to is that this interaction is favoring a checkerboard density modulation of the atomic cloud. This can also be understood if you think of the momentum which is transferred, transferred onto an atom when it scatters a photon. So you see that scattering this photon from the pump into the cavity results in a momentum kick onto the atom, which is recoiling in this diagonal direction. And this checkerboard lattice is nothing else than the Fourier transform of um, these diagonal momentum components. Now, you can um, tune the strength of this long-range interaction either by sending more photons onto the atoms, so increasing the pump power P here, or by reducing the detuning between the pump and the cavity, which facilitates the scattering into the cavity mode. That's not all. The system is an open system. So, photons can also leak out of one of the mirrors, and this has two important consequences. On one side, it's an excellent observation channel through which we can observe the, in real time what happens with our atoms. And that's something which is very unusual for cold atoms, where you usually perform your experiment and then have a destructive imaging. In this case, now we can study in real time what the system does, and we can also have access to the fluctuations. On the other side, um, having an open system makes it a driven dissipative situation. And that's exactly what I would like to talk to you about in my second part of the talk. Okay, so this is the, the basic functioning mechanism, how we get this long-range interactions. And we can also describe this with an equation. And that will be, well, more or less the only equation I will present to you. But it's important and it will come back to you uh, during my talk. So this is the single particle Hamiltonian for uh, an atom which we put inside this cavity and pump from the side with this transverse pump. So you see the first term here tells you the energy of the photons in a rotating frame. So it's this detuning between pump and cavity and A dagger A is the number of photons inside the cavity. The second term is about the kinetic energy of the atoms. So if they schedule a photon, they gain kinetic energy. The third term is the pump lattice potential. You see it's a standing wave along the pump direction and it has the strength VP, that's the strength of this pump field. This term here is the cavity lattice potential. It's again a standing wave, so cosine square, uh, along the cavity and it's only active if there is a photon inside the cavity, so if A dagger A is non-zero. Now the last term is the most important here, it's the interaction. So you see it's the interaction potential. It's this checkerboard lattice I was talking about, and it scales with the coherent field amplitude A plus A dagger of the cavity field. So you can see it as a potential which the atoms feel due to the presence of the pump and cavity field. Or you can see it as a pump of the cavity. So the atoms are scattering photons into the cavity, and by this they are pumping the cavity. Now, why is this the important term? So, it competes with the kinetic energy. So, if you think of minimizing this Hamiltonian, the energy of the, um, of the system, then um, what this kinetic energy wants is to flatten out the wave function. So, this is uh, minimizing kinetic energy. On the other side, this interaction potential uh, wants this, um, wants this um, wave function of the atoms to form a checkerboard. So it wants to bend the wave function and this costs kinetic energy. So there's this um, competition between two energy scales, potential and kinetic energy, and this gives rise to a phase transition between a normal phase where you have a flat density and an empty cavity and a superradiant phase where you have a modulated density and a filled cavity mode. 
And if you think of the potential which the atoms are feeling now along the cavity axis, for example, you see that it has a lambda spaced uh, minima if the atoms are in the super radiant phase. So this is this potential I was showing at the very beginning where the atoms are then sucked into uh, because they are scattering the photons. That was the single particle Hamiltonian. Well, if you want to go to a many body description, you need to sandwich it in between your field operators and you add also the collisional interactions. This looks very complicated at the end. But we are lucky that we have a Bose Einstein condensate, which you can describe very simple. So this field operator can be described in our case just by two terms. One is the Bose Einstein condensate. So that's um, if you think of a momentum state, and this is a momentum state representation here, it's the zero momentum state of the BEC. So that's along X and Y direction, no momentum. Now, if the atoms are scattering photons, they acquire this diagonal momentum kicks, and then there's another mode, h bar k, h bar k here, corresponding to this yellow marbles, and that's this excited momentum state. So you can see that we map this, we can map the system onto a two-level system, actually, although it's a complicated many-body system. And this allows us to write it as a macroscopic spin, a collective spin operator which is now composed out of these two, um, these two modes, which I defined for you. And what we end up is the Dickey model. So that's the paradigmatic model of quantum optics, where you have many atoms interacting with a mode of the electromagnetic field. And you see that this is now our collective spin, which interacts here. OK. Now, in the experiment, um, we can look what we have, and um, this is well, this is one Swiss franc here, and these are our cavity mirrors, and this is a comparison in size, not in price. They are super expensive, but you see that they're very small, and um, they form this ultra-high finesse cavity, and these are the cavity parameters. You see the length of our cavity is only 0.2 millimeters. It's a very short cavity, and if you look now from the side into the gap between the two mirrors, then you see that um, uh, there's a, a gap and, and this black cloud here, or this black dot, is actually the shadow of our Bose-Einstein condensate. So these are 10 to the 5 rubidium-87 atoms below 100 nanokelvin. So that's our Bose-Einstein condensate, which we can observe in time of light. Now, atoms and cavity are stored in our ultra-high vacuum chamber. So this is this um, metal tank here. And you see that it's surrounded by optics. So it's a fairly complicated experiment which you need to build in order to have access um, to the system. Now, this is the first data I would like to show to you. It's uh, the structural phase transition between a normal phase and the super radiant phase. So what we do is that we prepare the cloud inside the cavity and illuminate the atoms from the side with a laser field. And the power of this laser field is shown here as a dashed line. And you see that um, while we increase this pump power over time, we are monitoring the photons leaking out of the cavity. And the signal is sh shown here as this blue line. So although we are sending photons onto the, cavity, uh, onto the atoms, uh, they're not scattering into the cavity, so there's no light coming out of the cavity. If we take a time of flight image, so we analyze the momentum components um, which are uh, occupied in the system, you see that there's only one momentum component corresponding to the Bose-Einstein condensate which is occupied. This changes if we now increase the, the pump power further, because at a certain point now this kinetic energy and the interaction energy compete, and this is where the phase transition is taking place. And you see this by a sharp rise in the light field inside the cavity. And at the same time, if you take a time of flight image, you see that these additional momentum components are now occupied, and this corresponds to the checkerboard, which is formed uh, in this atomic medium. So they act now like a bread mirror at which the photons can be efficiently scattered into the cavity. So our control parameter is the pump power, and if you ramp it down again, we retrieve uh, another phase transition, and this is then back to the normal state. That's not all. We can also look at the phase of the light field. So this was the intensity of the light field using a heterodyne detector, where we split off a part of our pump and then interfere it with the light coming from the cavity. We can also measure the phase 
of this light field. And you see that this phase is locked when it's um, in the super radiant state. And um, this tells you that the atoms are forming a fixed grating in space at this moment. So they form really a crystal of matter and light at the same time. Most importantly, yes. excuse me. Uh, do you ramp um, uh, up and down the intensity with the same speed? Because the curve looks uh, asymmetric in the speed at which it, uh, the photon number grows and goes back to zero. Yes, so the, the ramp time is the same. Um, you have a very sharp eye. Um, so yes, it's a bit different. And you also see that there's a slope on top of it. And this is now, um, when I told you we have a perfectly controlled system, that's not true, we have atom loss. So the uh, atom evolves a bit over time, and if you want to not suffer from this dissipation, you need to make your experiments fast. Okay. <laughs> but very importantly, you see that our light field is a measure of the atomic density modulation and also of the fluctuations. So we can really read read a lot of this uh, the signal um, in order to understand what this phase transition is doing to our atoms. For example, we can look at a discrete symmetry breaking. So this Dicke model is um, has a Z2 symmetry, so it's a discrete spatial symmetry, and if you now <clears throat> ramp in and out of our phase consecutively multiple times, and then look at the time phase of the light field inside the cavity, you see that it acquires two distinct values. And they correspond to um, a checkerboard lattice, which is either occupied on the even sides or on the odd sides. So this is this symmetry which is spontaneously broken each time you enter the self-organized phase. And if you remember this potential which I was plotting for you before, then you see that there's also this dashed line potential and that corresponds now to this Z2 symmetric parameter. Or if you think in terms of an order parameter, then our control parameter is the pump power and at the critical point here you see there's a bifurcation or actually the symmetry is broken and the order parameter changes from zero to a finite value which can be positive or negative corresponding to uh, occupying the even sides or the odd sides of a checkerboard lattice. Okay, so this was my introduction to long-range interactions and um, how they can give rise to pattern formation in a system. Now, um, I come to the first main part of my talk, which is um, about self-organization now in repulsive potentials. This is done in a slightly different apparatus, where you see here now the heart, and uh, we, are, we are proud of this heart, because you see it's, it's small optics, which is all uh, mounted onto a platform. This is like five centimeters, and it's again deep in a vacuum chamber. And if I look from top on this setup, then you see that uh, these are all small mirrors, and there are two pairs of cavities which cross. And that's something we built for another experiment, but now for the experiments I want to show you now, it's only one cavity which is important. So this formed by these two mirrors which face each other. We are looking from top onto this cavity, and there's yet another mirror which sits here, and this is retro-reflecting a pump field which comes from the side, is going back. And if we put atoms at this cross point, then these atoms can scatter photons into that cavity. Now, if I repeat what I told you before, then these atoms, if you have attractive potentials, they can form this checkerboard order, and we can measure now the phase diagram of the system. So our control parameters are the pump strength, so we're sending more photons onto the atoms, and the detuning between the cavity and the pump field, delta C. And you see, that the system can acquire two different phases. Either it's in the normal phase, where this uh, area here is white, which means there are no photons inside the cavity, or it's red, where we have photons inside the cavity. And you see that if we are closely tuned with respect to the cavity resonance, so for small delta C, we only lead, need a little pump field in order to reach this um, self-organized phase. And if we go further detuned, we need a stronger pump field. If you look in time of flight, so again, analyzing these momentum components, you see a very similar picture than before. It's a bit different because it's now skewed. So you see these four momentum peaks here, and they are skewed because we have an angle between the pump and the cavity. 
And you see here the elementary scattering processes, taking a photon from a cavity into the pump, gives you one kind of um, uh, scattering process and um, sketching into the other direction gives you another momentum. Okay, there are more momentum peaks which we can see here and they come from a standing wave along the pump direction, the standing wave along the cavity direction. So it's all the Fourier transform of the real space um, distribution of the atoms. Now all this is for attractive potentials. So attractive means the frequency of the laser field is rapidly tuned with respect to the atomic resonance. So atoms are attracted to the intensity maxima of the light field. It's like an optical tweezer where you trap an atom or a particle in the intensity maximum. But now you can ask what happens if you go to the inverse situation where you have a repulsive potential. So this is something you can do just by tuning the frequency of your laser to the blue side of the atomic resonance. And now the atoms are pushed to the dark regions. So they want to avoid the light field. And if you think now of this blue lattice, which is our pump lattice, and we put this black atomic cloud into it, you see that the atoms accumulate at the position where there is no light field. And now you can ask whether it's at all possible that these atoms self-organize with respect to a cavity. So do they still want to scatter efficiently photons into the cavity, although they try to avoid high intensities? Well, indeed they do, and that's our sketch of it. So what they do is that they organize in a way that they sit at the intensity maxima, but they scatter light into the cavity, and this light field of the cavity is interfering destructively with the pump field. So it's a destructive interference effect, which still gives rise then to a self-organization of this matter. Now, if you think of the phase diagram I've shown you for the rectitude case, then you saw that um, uh, that's the phase diagram. We have the momentum components, and if I were to zoom into real space, then this would be this checkerboard structure the atoms are acquiring when they self-organize. And if I go to now a bluey tuned field, so I switch the frequency of my laser, atoms are repelled from the light field, I still am able to record a phase diagram and you see that it looks qualitatively different. So you see this tip here, so except of extending to very high pump fields, um, this, um, this phase diagram shows only a tip and then uh, it exits again the self-organized or the superradiant phase. Now you can ask, well, what, what goes on there and, and do we understand this? And we can look in time of flight and we see that Ah, actually the atoms, when they are self-organized in the superradiant phase, they acquire a different um, structure. So they don't occupy all these momentum peaks, but only two additional ones. And this corresponds actually to a striped order which the atoms form here. So it's like two different configurations of a crystal um, which can be accessed. Now, oh, yes. 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 I can ask. Uh, if you can, yes, so uh, you say the atoms uh, sit at the maxima of intensity of the pump when there is, if you consider only in the pump, but they actually, uh, the atoms uh, emit a scattered field which compensate so that in the end they are, the total field is dark, is a zero at mm -hmm. the place where they sit. Okay, okay. It's, it's a funny it's a funny situation we we initially naively wouldn't have expected this mm -hmm. so if you now look back at this hamiltonian the single particle hamiltonian which i've shown to you and i promised it will come back to you now it's now it's the moment uh, then you see that um this um, pump potential and the cavity potential they both go uh, with this vp and u naught and these two parameters scale with one over the tuning, so one over the atomic detuning, which means if you flip the sign of this atomic detuning, this pump potential turns from attractive to repulsive, as well as the cavity potential. But now this interaction potential, which gives then rise to the self-organization, you see it contains both VP and U0. So if I flip the sign of both, at the end I didn't flip the sign of the interaction potential. So now I, I show to you what happens if I flip that sign, but I don't flip 
the sign of this interaction potential. So now this is for the attractive case, that's rectitude case. I apply my pump lattice potential, which you see here, and you ask, where are the atoms sitting? Well, they minimize the energy in a ground state wave function, which has its maximum there, where the pump potential has its minimum. Fine. Then I plot also this interaction potential, which um, has the same parity. So you see it, the minimum of this interaction potential sits at the minimum of the pump lattice potential, but it has twice the periodicity because here's a cosine squared and here's only a cosine. Okay, so um, this interaction potential is coupling my atoms in the ground state to a state of the same parity. It stays in the same band. And uh, what I shown you previously, this potential here is nothing else than uh, now I cut out of this potential is shown here. It's the sum of the pump and the interaction potential which gives rise to this lambda periodic structure. Now for the blue detune case, we flip the sign of delta A, which means we flip the sign of this pump lattice potential. So you see here this dashed line and with respect to this, this pump lattice potential is flipped which means also the atomic wave function will be now shifted in space mm, because they still want to sit at the minimum of this pump lattice potential. But now you see that this interaction potential is not flipped because it contains both VP and U0. So the atoms are now coupled to a state of opposite parity. And if I plot for you the, the sum of pump potential and interaction potential, you see that it looks fundamentally different. It's now a double well structure, which is lambda periodic. So now you can understand why it, it, the structure the atoms form will look different, actually. It's a different crystal. But why is the system exiting this self-organized phase again if I go to deep lattices? That's something you can understand if you think of the band structure. So here is the the dispersion relation of the atoms. So that's uh, quasi-momentum and this is energy. And you see we, the Bose-Einstein condensate is prepared in quasi-momentum equal zero state. And then this coupling by the photons goes to a state at finite momentum, um, which sits for the rectitude case and the same band in the S band. So it's the same parity. It's different for the blue detune case because now we are also coupled to a state at finite momentum, but it sits uh, in the P band. So that's, uh, that's a difference. And now if you ask what happens if you increase the pump lattice potential, then you will say, well, this um, P and the S band, they will separate, there's a gap which opens. And um, very important, our coupling is introducing a minimum, a local minimum in this, um, in this dispersion relation. It's like a roton minimum which emerges and then once this rotor minimum hits zero energy, the atoms will actually self-organize and the system will become more and more stable the larger my pump power is, the deeper this potential becomes. Different for the blue detune case, because now I still couple to this state here, there will be also a minimum emerging in the P band, but when this hits zero, um, the atoms self-organize, but for deeper and deeper lattices, you will see that the gap opening will pull out this minima again out of the zero, and that is exactly where this phase is left again. So now we understand why the self-organization actually um, is not sustained for increasing pump lattices, and we understand why the structure looks different. Okay, <clears throat> now um, you see that we have two different crystalline configurations for the red and the blue detune case, and this looks like an, an interesting um, combination of phases and we ask ourselves whether we can have the opportunity to observe both at the same time. But having blue and red detuned light fields is not so easy and we came up with another solution. So our solution is to not use a single standing wave pump field onto the atoms but to take a combination of a pump field in one direction and a pump field in the other direction which have different strengths. So if I describe this here, the electric field components, then you see that I have a forward propagating beam and a backward propagating beam, and they don't have the same amplitude. And this uh, smaller amplitude means nothing else than I have a running wave component and a standing wave component. Now, why does this help me? I go back to the 
single particle Hamiltonian, I've shown to you now many times. Um, well, this doesn't change um, at this moment where I showed this part of it to you. You see only that this, um, this interaction potential, potential is a bit smaller because we have now this reduced standing wave component, but the structure looks the same. But now, um, having a running wave component means that there's not only the cosine of the pump, but there's also a sine part of the pump, because you can build a running wave as a combination of cosine and sine. So you see that there's a sine wave, which means we are flipping again the sign of this potential, and this gives rise to this inverted potential, which was the typical potential for the rectitude case. Ah, there's a question. How can you have a running wave? Oh, the question disappeared. Uh, perhaps you unmute and ask it. Uh, I think her microphone is uh, broken. This, ah, can, um, can you read the question? Yes, yes, yes. How can you have a running wave if the cavity is linear? Ah, okay. So your mic doesn't work. That's fine. Um, the running wave. So uh, the, the cavity still has a standing wave. You are completely right. This will never sustain a running wave component. However, you see that we have, uh, I was talking about the pump field. And the pump field um, was previously a only a standing wave. But now you can imagine that we have a standing wave. And in addition, we send an additional beam in uh, on the direction of the running uh, of this of the standing wave and this additional field is not compensated by something counter propagating and this gives rise to a running field in the system so if that's not clear please um sh sh shout it's up or try again <laughs> okay um and now this this running wave component gives rise to this different crystalline structure i was talking about and most importantly, you see um, that just by plugging in this, this electric field, which I defined for you into our equation, you see that this, um, this other structure is now not coupled to the real quadrature of the light field inside the cavity, but to the imaginary quadrature. So it's pi over 2 out of phase with this respect to the other field. OK, so we did this experiment. We implemented a imbalanced pump onto the atoms, which means they're exposed to running and standing wave at the same time. And this is the phase diagram which we find, again, as a function of the pump power and of this, atomic uh, of this cavity detuning. And you see that we see this typical structure of this repulsive self-organized state corresponding to uh, this double valve potential. But in addition, we find something which looks like this red organized, this attractive potential. And indeed, if you take time of flight images at this position of our phase diagram, we find the stripes. And if we take it here, we find this checkerboard order. So it's actually two crystalline configurations, and we can um, switch the system between the two. So it's a structural phase transition. And um, I told you that we can use the, the, the light field to measure properties of the system. And so you see here how important it is to measure also the phase of the light field. Because you see that this phase is zero in the stripe order, and it's um, pi over 2 in this checkerboard order. So this is just now measuring either the real or the imaginary quadrature. And you see that it flips between the two quadratures uh, when the system undergoes a phase transition. OK, so I interpret this now as a structural phase transition in the system. And if I define a unit cell of my crystal, then you see this is the stripe order. And that's my unit cell. And if the system undergoes this phase transition, then it flips into a checkerboard order. And you see that there's a current. So it's a polarization change in the system uh, which we can observe here in real time, because we can drive the system in real time from one crystal to the other. And this is a first order phase transition. So if you think of a free energy landscape, then you start in this global minimum, and uh, there might be a local minimum the system can also access. And um, if we change our control parameter, then the system can jump into this other now global minimum, and uh, then we can observe how this happens. <laughs> 
And that's um, something I can show to you in real time. So we follow this trajectory here. <clears throat> we prepare it in this stripe order, and then we ramp up the pump power. And look what happens. And I show now a movie for you. And in this movie, I plot the phase of the light field. So you see, if um, the phase is, uh, if the system is in the stripe state, then we expect zero phase. And after going into this checkerboard phase, we expect pi over two. I can also plot for you on a polar plot here, a real and imaginary part of the cavity field. And you see, we start here with occupying only the real part. Now we ramp up the pump power. And at the critical point, the system jumps to the other state. And you can see here how it ends up in this new global minimum. And then this crystal is damped uh, after it underwent this structural phase transition. And that's something which we can observe in the light field. OK, so to it's funny, uh, why is the uh, label structural phase transition? It's still a regular phase transition as well. Uh... Yes, it's a well. It's a specific phase transition. It's a phase transition which affects the crystalline structure, and that makes it a structural phase transition. Okay. Okay. So to ah now it wants to do it again. So uh, to summarize this this part here, I, I showed you a phase transition between two different structures, and um, actually there was a second order phase transition when you went from the normal phase to either super radiant phase and there was a first order structural phase transition when we uh, looked at the system going from one to the other okay so um, if there are questions to this part then uh, that might be a, a good moment or i can also take them at the very end there's one question the oscillation the phase of the bottom right graph comes from where exactly so this is uh, this oscillation here and that's something which you might understand if you think of this um this free energy landscape so in this free energy landscape you see that the system was jumping from the local minimum to the global minimum and then as indicated by this blue balls here uh, there is energy because you have this this latent heat in the system and this latent heat needs to be um, released somewhere or absorbed somewhere and then uh, the atoms will actually collide uh, with each other and by this distribute this um, this excess energy in in the Bogolubov modes of this Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, but this frequency is given if you want by the curvature of this free energy um, of this free energy state. And this gives rise to, to this oscillation that we see. Okay, are there any more questions about this transition? If not, you can have them later on. And I um, come now to the last part of my talk, which is about the dissipation stabilized phase. So um, let's take a step back and uh, think on very, very general means of a quantum many-body system. So we have many particles. And if they don't interact, they're boring. But now let's make them interact. And uh, this will become more interesting because now Due to the interaction, if it's long range, they can actually form structures. And such a structure formation can give rise to, now I plotted for you two different kinds of checkerboard orders. One would be um, like a constant density, but different spin flavors if you want. And this is structured density. And now depend if you ask in which of the two uh, orders the system will, will end up, it depends on a control parameter. So it depends on the Hamiltonian parameters which you dial in in your quantum simulation. And if you uh, overcome a certain critical value in your control parameter, then you'll see the phase transition between the two different orders. And now you can ask, well, what, what happens if I add drive and dissipation to the system? And that's exactly what I tried to motivate at the beginning, that, that something interesting might happen here. Not so exciting, but to be expected is that the presence of dissipation and drive can shift the position of a critical point. Okay, but um, more 
deeply is if you think of the critical properties. So if you think of a second order phase transition, then um, usually it's dominated by fluctuations at the critical point and this fluctuations scale with some power law behavior and a critical exponent um, if you come to the critical point. And this is a universal property which describes all the systems with the same dimensionality and the same symmetry of the Hamiltonian. So it's a very general uh, quantity. And what we could show and what was also shown uh, theoretically is that opening a system, so making it a driven dissipative system, changes the uni uni universality class. So that's something which is interesting. But there can be more. So instead of actually going into a steady state, a stationary state, there can be actually non-stationary states. So the system might not even be able to find its steady state anymore. There can be synchronization, limit cycles, chaos, and there can be new phases which you can expect. So going from a closed system description to an open system description tells you that it can be pretty exciting what the physics is doing. Now, if you think of the platforms you could use, then I claim that the most useful platforms for this are systems which combine light and matter. Because light and matter on the light part, uh, it's easy to implement both loss and drive, and they give you this um, real-time characterization of the system. And then many different platforms which you can think of. So many of them are solid state systems like heterostructures, or you can think of carbon nanotubes. You can think of like superconducting circuits or uh, exciton polarity and condensates. And well, what's common to all of them is the interaction between light and matter. And if you go to the fundamentals of light matter interaction, you will end up at the Rabi model. So it's a single two-level atom coupled to a single mode of the electromagnetic field and the interaction Hamiltonian or the part of this interaction Hamiltonian um, is shown here. So you have the raising operator of this two-level system and the lowering operator of the two-level system and you have annihilation creation operator of the light field. And this G is the coupling. Now, usually, if you look at such a simple coupling, you apply the rotating wave approximation because you see that they're energy non-conserving terms. So, sigma plus times A dagger, which would mean you are creating an excitation in the matter and in the photonic field at the same time, that's unlikely if you are not in a super strong coupling, coupling regime. And this is when you apply the rotating wave approximation and end up at the James Cummins model. You can do something very similar if you think of many atoms. So the analogon to the Rabi model then is the Dickey model, n atoms coupled to a single cavity mode. And that's exactly what I've shown you previously. So we have now a macroscopic spin, a collective spin, which is coupled to this light field. Also in this system, if you are not going to this strong coupling regime, so if you're not undergoing this phase transition, you uh, can apply a rotating wave approximation and you end up at the Tevis Cummings model. So you're neglecting this energy non conserving terms. Okay, now for curiosity, we were studying a model, first theoretically, uh, which interpolates between this Dickey model and the Tevis Cummings model. So you see that uh, we can balance now the uh, rotating and the counter rotating terms of this electromagnetic field atom interaction. And uh, this is done by changing these parameters lambda x and lambda y, uh, which couple the x or the y component of this collective spin. And you arrive to this interpolating Dicke Tevis Cummings model if you apply uh, these identities here. Okay, why, uh, why is this interesting or how does it look? So this is the, the full model. It looks like the Dickey model, but it has this additional term which couples to the, the Y quadrature. And if I solve um, this Hamiltonian and ask for the phase diagram of the system, then you see that um, it looks like this. There are three different phases. Um, if you look in a parameter space characterized by the coupling along the X axis and along the Y axis, so that's the X component and the Y component. And uh, one phase is the normal phase where the system is, uh, the cavity is not occupied, so A dagger A is zero, and there's no field in the system, it's not super radiant. 
And then there are two other phases where uh, either the real quadrature or the imaginary quadrature is occupied. Now, there, there are two interesting limits of the system. One limit is when either lambda x is e equals to zero or lambda y equals zero. So you neglect either this term or you neglect that term. And then you end up again at the Dickey model. So that's the physics I've shown you in the first part of my talk. And then if you go to the case where lambda x equals lambda y, it's the Tevis Cummings limit. So this is now where we neglect or we are able to neglect uh, the counter rotating terms. That's on the diagonal. This Tevis Cummings model actually has a U1 symmetry if you're interested. And uh, those two phases, as I said, are uh, characterized by either occupying the real or only the imaginary part. Okay, now if I take this closed system and ask um, how does it look, this phase diagram, in an open system description, then I can solve the mean field um, equations for this master equation here, where I take dissipation into account. So this dissipation is now the cavity decay. And you see that this phase diagram looks qualitatively different. Most important, you see that um, this normal phase, so where there's no photon inside the cavity, not super radiant, extends to very high couplings. So it's a sliver in this phase diagram, which is only there because there was um, dissipation in the system. So it opens up for infinitesimal dissipation. And the other quantitative qualitative difference, which you see it, is that um, there are two coexistence regions. So this pale red and this pale blue region, they um, are coexistence between this normal phase and the super radiant phase. So depending on from where I enter this pale region, the system stays either normal or stays super radiant. And uh, you will also see that real and imaginary part are both occupied in both phases. Okay, now we said, let's um, try to implement this model in our experiment. And for this, we needed not to only couple the light field to the density, but also to the spin degree of the atoms. So it's a bit more complicated than before. Um, we encode our two levels in two spin states of our rubidium 87 atoms. So it's two Zeeman states. And you prepare the atoms in this state, which we call zero, and uh, they are prepared in a bose einstein condensate. So that's the wave function, if you want. And now we apply a light field, which we shine onto the atoms, as before. But we tune the frequency of this light field such that um, if a photon is scattered at the atoms, it will um, be more or less resonant with this Zeeman splitting between these two states. So you see this on the frequency axis here. That's our cavity resonance. That's the frequency of the pump field. And um, the Zeeman shifted state sits here. So we, uh, the atoms like to scatter into that state. And then they end up in a different Zeeman state. And they are density modulated because they interact with this light field in, in the way I told you before. OK, if I don't do more, they, I just pump the atoms here. The photons leak out of the resonator. and if I apply a second field, this blue detuned field, then I can pump the atoms back from this state into that state, again via this cavity um, emission of, um, of this field. So it's like a spontaneous process where I um, pump the atoms again um, towards the same frequency. Well, but now you see that um, if the atom at photons um, arrive inside the cavity, they live at this frequency and um, they live for some time inside the cavity and then they can actually also be considered as being coherent. And then uh, you see that you close an interesting loop here in this level diagram. And this is like having both the rotating and the counter rotating terms of metal light interacting being active. So there's both this dissipative process where photons leak out and you have just the simple scattering. And there is this coherent coupling where you have um, this loop with being closed. Okay, so that's uh, the full diagram you should have in mind. And now um, you need to believe me that uh, we can show that we can 
with this arrangement of laser fields and frequencies, we can build this interpolating Dickey-Tavis Cummings model. So we can actually implement this term where we have separate control over co and counter rotating couplings um, in this in this model. And uh, now you see that coupling to the JX quantity or quadrature means that we are um, uh, coupling with a coupling strength eta bar, which is the sum of the two Rabi rates. So it's the intensities of these two fields and the sum gives rise to the coupling to the X quadrature and the difference between the two. So eta red minus eta blue gives rise to um, coupling to the imaginary quadrature to the Y quadrature. Okay, so we can just by tuning now the pump powers, red and blue, we can um, set these parameters in our model. And first of all, we can go to the Dickey limit. So we want to neglect this term. So delta equal should be zero, which means we need to make uh, eta red equals to eta blue. So we want equal powers in those two beams. And this gives rise or should give rise to the Dickey model. Now, if you think of the Dickey model, then there's a mode softening, which you can expect. Here you see um, the energy of the ground state on of the first excited state as a function of eta bar, so of this coupling parameter here. And you see that if we increase this coupling parameter, there's a mode softening, and at the critical point, the system will undergo its phase transition to the superradiant state, as I have told you before. Well, but now um, I argued that there is this, there are these dissipative processes which take place. And I've only talked about coherences here. But now I can show you that there's a dissipation which takes place, which dissipates this excited state to the ground state and the second dissipation channel, which dissipates the ground state to the excited state. And this gamma up and gamma down, they scale with this, um, with this rather rates of the pump field, so with the intensities which we are which we apply. And you see that if I tune now delta equal delta equal eta equals to zero, so if I have them balanced, then these two dissipation rates are also balanced. So at the end they effectively don't act. Now if I um, change this imbalance, so if I change delta eta by imbalancing these two fields, uh, then at some point one of those dissipation channels is dominant and this point at this point there will be no super radiant phase anymore and the system stays normal and that's something which we can tune in our experiment and uh, that's the last thing i would like to show to you it's shown here um, over time we are ramping up um, eta bar and delta eta so that's the sum and the difference of these two pump fields and uh, that's shown as a dashed and a solid line, black line. And at the same time, I show to you here how the system turns super radiant. So that's photons inside the cavity. Uh, that's the phase diagram. It's um, eta bars on the horizontal axis, delta eta, the difference between the pump fields on the vertical axis. We are only interested into this lower quadrant. The upper one is mirrored with respect to the lower one. And most importantly, you see that we have this normal phase, we have a super radiant phase where there's photons inside the cavity. And you see that there is indeed this sliver which was predicted before this dissipation stabilized normal phase. We can identify the phase transition. So um, if you repeat this experiment many times, we can identify those, those transition points and we can model it with a numerical simulation and we find fair agreement between the two. One thing I was telling you was um, that there's also this hysteresis or um, this coexistence region, which uh, was in the theoretical model was this pale uh, blue or pale red triangle here. And indeed, if we prepare the system in the normal phase, go down into the super radiant phase and up again, then we observe that the system stays in the normal phase, then turns super radiant. And if we go back, we form this hysteresis loop. So indeed, this is something which we can uh, recover here. Last observation I would like to hear. Excuse me, Tobias, may you go back to the... So is this the delay? Uh, no, because you see a delay in your first picture. It, uh, the system uh, before five milliseconds, the system doesn't change uh, 
And where you put the vertical gray line. Yes. So this is, uh, no, this is, I would claim, an adiabatic change of parameters. And at mm -hmm. this five milliseconds, it's only that um, now kinetic energy and potential energy compete and the system undergoes its phase transition. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also yeah. here, I claim we can do this very slowly and would still recover more or less the same hysteresis loop. So this is not a, ah, a dynamic okay. effect, it's real mm -hmm. hysteresis, it's real coexistence of phases. Okay, you don't expect it to depend on the time uh, yes. for this hysteresis. Okay, thanks. Okay, last thing um, is about excitations in the system. So um, I've told you that there's this mode softening in, in the Dickey model. If you increase the coupling, there's an excited state which becomes soft, and when this hits zero energy, then the system is going into a new ground state. That's something we can measure in the system. So we excite the system with a pulse. We send a short pulse which shakes the atoms, and when they shake or vibrate, we get a light from the pump field into the cavity, and we can analyze the frequency of this light field. And this frequency is shown on this axis here with respect to our pump field, which impinges at zero energy. And while, uh, so we, we apply this orange pulse here at zero time, and then um, the system still shakes, although we don't apply this pulse anymore. And uh, while it shakes, we increase the coupling strength. So we let the system undergo this phase transition. And so that's like a guitar string, like, like the Jimi Hendrix, um, where you, uh, slosh your guitar and then you slide uh, on the guitar bar and you listen to what the system is doing and in this case the frequency is lowering and you see that uh, when the frequency approaches zero then the system undergoes this phase transition. Okay so this was following um, this Dicke line here where delta eta equals to zero but now as I told you going away from this delta eta equals zero line introduces dissipation processes into the system. So we can go like this or like that or like this and um, the stronger this delta eta becomes this imbalance the stronger the dissipation is and you see that um, these plots here are for increasing dissipation so this is delta eta over eta bar and you see that um, this excitation lives shorter and shorter, and at some point it actually doesn't live anymore. So here you see that there's no um, superradiance which is entered. If we look, uh, if we solve the equations and look for the excitation spectrum, then you see the real part here, which shows this mode softening. So that's exactly what we observed. And if I ask for the lifetime of this. Um, of this excitation which I put into the system, then you see that it decays pretty fast. And um, this corresponds then to the imaginary part of this excitation spectrum, which becomes large if I go to a large imbalance delta eta. Okay, so um, that was the summary, or this is the summary of the second part. If you imagine you have a quantum many-body system and you allow it to experience drive and dissipation, what we observed is that there's a strong change due to the presence of the dissipation. And this, this change is actually modifying the phase diagram in a qualitative way. That's something which we could implement in the experiment and uh, we could then identify this microscopic uh, processes, dissipative processes, which gave rise to the change in the phase diagram. Okay, with this I'm at the end. I would like to acknowledge my co-workers. So this experiments were done in two different teams, um, um, where you see I would like to highlight at least the postdocs, so David Drion and um, Francesco Ferri, and then uh, also Carlos Maximo, who, who joined us actually from Brazil. And all this is done in the group of Tilman Esslinger. So with this, um, if you like this topic, I would like to advertise a, a seminar which takes place, a three-day seminar, uh, which takes place in Germany, in Bad Honnef. Uh, but now you can say, due to the, luckily due to the pandemic, uh, 
uh, it will be an online seminar. So um, it will not so hard be so hard for you to join. You just have to sign up and you need uh, to respect the deadline, which is 8th of April. And this is about collective effects and non-equilibrium quantum dynamics. Okay, with this um, at the end, if you like the topic, there's a review article on quantum gases coupled to a cavity, where you can read about uh, this on a general, general level. And um, the repulsive potential self-organization is summarized in these two articles, and the dissipation stabilized normal phase will soon be on the archive. I thank you for your patience and questions. Thank you very much, Tobias, for the very nice uh, presentation. Are there some questions? Maybe I, uh, maybe I can open. Um, uh, so I was curious, uh, what? So your uh, the time scale of your experiment was typically uh, milliseconds. Or, um, yes, so it's so typically we we can investigate this over hundreds of milliseconds. Mm -hmm. where, um, it's limited by atom loss at the end, so okay. a scattering of the atoms on due to photons. And uh, the dynamics is given by the recoil energy, which is then order of millisecond. Okay, so it means that uh, the atoms need milliseconds to organize. Well, let's say uh, one millisecond. 100 microseconds. Mm -hmm. Okay. 